Hello, party people, and welcome to office hours. Sometimes I come to you from glamorous locations on the side of a volcano, at the side of an ocean, a cruise ship, whatever. Sometimes I come to you from the home office. Today I am coming to you from a hotel room. I am in London. Uh, at the tail end of our European trip, we're getting ready to fly back home. The bags are all over the floor. We have to go repack today. Uh, we've been out through Europe for like the last month, uh, did a two-week cruise, spent some time in Barcelona, then did a two-week cruise all through the Mediterranean, did Data Saturday Croatia, and then now we just got done with sequel bits in London. And it was such a whirlwind uh, conference there that I just didn't get a time to film in a glamorous location. And the important part, of course, of office hours I was going to say is your questions, but that's not really the important part either. The important part, I suppose, is my answers, not where I am. So thus the hotel room. Let's do this. The top voted question comes to us from Shane. Shane says, hi, Brent. I'm early in my career and I enjoy learning about SQL Server performance tuning. Is it a bad bet for me to focus on that? With how AI is developing, will it make performance tuning less needed in the future? You know, I heard, it's, a, it's a perfect timing on that because I one of the sessions that I attended at SQL Bits on Saturday uh, was at one where the presenter, Simon Whiteley, someone who I respect and his presentations are, are quite good, uh, made the bold claim that within five years, uh, data engineering will be dead and that you won't, you'll, uh, data pipelines will be self-tuning, we won't need to worry about performance because AI will handle all of that for us. I think five years is probably a pretty bold prediction there. Uh, people have been claiming that databases are going to be self-tuning for decades. SQL Server 2000's documentation actually made the claim that the database was self-tuning back SQL Server 2000. That was 25 years ago. And yet somehow it still turns out uh, that if you write bad code, the system doesn't fix that for you. And what kind of code does AI write? It tends to be bad code. I, I love artificial intelligence, but I don't think that the need for performance tuning is going away within the next five years. Now, having said that, I think if you're in IT, you should grow accustomed to learning things. You shouldn't expect that the same one set of skills that you use today will be the exact same set of skills that you use, say, five years or 10 years from now. Uh, you, the job that you do will constantly change in technology. So just start working on things now, but know that you may need to change as you go down the road. Uh, next up, Andrew says, have you ever worked with databases where the clustering key had to be different than the primary key? Yes, so often in large mature systems, someone will, uh, often in large mature systems, I hit situations where a table didn't have a clustered index, where it had a primary key, but the primary key was created as non-clustered. And so what we'll often do is go create a clustered index on the appropriate column, but that isn't necessarily what the primary key is. At that point, the primary key is just like any other index. Andrew continues by saying, have you seen any performance gains with this separation? Come zoom back and ask, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? You hear me ask this all the time on the session. Instead of saying, hey, I got these tools over here. Tell me about a time where they'll be useful. Don't do that because generally speaking, I can't afford to take the time to teach you about every single tool out there bring me your problem, and then let's solve it together in the fastest, most efficient way. Generally, designing new tables with the clustering key and the primary key being different is a pretty bad idea. And if you have to ask when it would be a good idea, take your hand back off that tool. It's not a good fit for you. Next up, speaking of clustered indexes, next up, my clustered index sucks asks, changing a clustered index seems too risky on very large critical tables in a system required 24-7. Okay, so stop right there. You shouldn't be changing a clustered index on a 24-7 system. 24-7 immediately implies transactional. It implies that users are doing inserts, updates, and deletes around the clock, and it's probably not 
batch operations like data warehouses because data warehouses tend not to be 24 seven. They're time windows that we get in there for loading. If you have a transactional system, changing the clustered index is not something that you want to do. Step back and ask, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And usually, you just need better non-clustered indexes. The clustered indexes for data storage, the non-clustered indexes are for data retrieval to rapidly find the rows that you want and then go pull back the appropriate columns for the clustered index. Uh, next up, my T got cold says, how can I have multiple basic availability groups with the same automatic failover? You can't. Basic, auto basic availability groups are one database at a time in standard edition. Now, in theory, you could write your own tool or script to say that when any one database fails over, please bring the rest of them along with it. But you just got to be really careful with that because the code could trigger on either side and you don't want to have a continuous fighting back and forth for who owns the availability group. If you need to guarantee that multiple databases fail over together, say hello to your good friend Enterprise Edition. And that's what that's for. Bandu says, when taking a new DBA job, what's the max number of uh, SQL servers you would feel comfortable being responsible for? So that implies that you're the only DBA. That implies that you're working by yourself. In that case, you want to find out what other resources you have available in the company. Because if you're the only person being on call when any of these things go down, you're going to have a really bad time. You want to find out if anybody else in the company has any SQL Server experience, if any can uh, spell you or give you some relief in the on-call rotation. Otherwise, being the only person on call during your job at a company for one set of servers is going to result in burnout eventually for you. If you're willing to take that risk, like if you want the job really badly, then that's a you question. How much risk are you willing to tolerate? Because the more servers that you have, the more likely it is that you're not going to get a free weekend because something will always be broken on one of the servers. Next up, Cavalieri asks, Hi Brent, I notice all of your examples include an ID column, an auto-incrementing uh, integer. Do you think that it's always necessary to have that column? No, not at all. And I talk about the situations where it doesn't make sense in my Mastering Index Tuning class in the Clustered Indexes module. When you're just getting started designing a table, by all means, throw an ID column on there. It's the easy way to get started. But as you get through two, three years worth of table design, then it's time to step into the mastering index tuning classes and learn about situations where alternatives make more sense. Bandu asks, how does administering a few SQL servers differ from administering 100 SQL servers? Uh, basically, you have to do automation by the time you hit 100 SQL servers. Uh, you can't uh, apply patches, for example, across 100 SQL servers. That would keep you busy full time. Backups, testing restores, testing cor for corruption, uh, doing uh, uh, provisioning has to be automated. Uh, so the, the more servers that you're administering, the more you have to be an expert at automation rather than clicking through wizards. Tractor DBA asks, uh, UDF was inlined, resulting in a complex execution plan which produced non-yielding schedulers hanging SQL. Only, da -da 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 -da, have you seen anything like this? So I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. What it sounds like you're asking is, can you troubleshoot this for me? And that's beyond the scope of something that we can do together over a, a Q&A format like this. You have a couple of options when you're having problems where SQL Server crashes with non-yielding schedulers. One is that you can open a support case with Microsoft. And, and of course, your necessity of doing this assumes that it's happening more than once. If it's something that just happened once and went bump in the night, I would generally not worry about it. But by the second time that it happens to a production server, then you're going to have to start paying attention and either opening support cases with Microsoft, talking to your support folks with your enterprise agreement, or hiring an outside consultant to help you do that kind of troubleshooting. But it, obviously, it's beyond something that I can just give you a quick answer for here. 
Alexi asks, what is your opinion of the new vector search functionality in SQL Server 2025? I don't really understand the point of it. I, the problem with vector search is that it assumes that those vectors are up to date. And that doesn't make a lot of sense when they generally are based on some external LLM. And whenever that vector data needs to change, like because the PDF contents have changed or, or uh, something about the model that you're using has changed, then you've got to regenerate all of those vectors again. It seems like you're using SQL Server as a caching layer, and there's no real way to do change detection when those outside files or embeddings have changed. So I don't really get it. I think I'm missing something that maybe there's some kind of business use where the data never changes and we need, or only rarely changes like once a month uh, and we need to do a vector search on it. I just don't know of a lot of data that stays that stable that long. In at least the clients that I work with, data changes fairly quickly. Information about products, for example, information about uh, people in a social network, information uh, about PDFs, documentation for products, uh, changes fairly quickly. So I, I don't really get the point of it. I don't think it's bad. I just think that people haven't really thought that through. Data does Data changes a lot. Eduardo says, the corporate dashboard tool Tableau takes control of T-SQL generation, but it builds bad queries. Any tips for performance tuning in this type of application? Yeah, generally speaking, uh, you've got three dials you can tune for SQL Server query performance. One dial is tweaking the queries, which you said you can't do. One dial is tweaking the tables and indexes, doing things like putting better indexes on, using column store indexes, giving people reporting views that are denormalized for faster performance. And then the third dial is hardware and licensing. You can throw more hardware horsepower at it. Those are the only three dials that we get. Query design, table and index design, hardware and licensing. So it's just which ones you want to turn up. In this case, you can either turn up hardware and licensing or you can turn up uh, table and index design. Those are just your choices. And then we'll do one more. Adrian asks, uh, Hi Brent, I took all of your fundamentals courses and I still cannot make a max run fast, like max a B group by A having max B greater or less than 10. Does it help to look for the mastering courses? No, I think you missed. Fundamentals of Column Store. Column Store is phenomenal for that kind of thing. Um, and also I would say too, it depends on what your meaning of fast is and what the size of the data is. If you have a billion rows, Column Store indexes still probably isn't going to help you get it across the finish line uh, in, if your definition of fast is say 100 milliseconds. In that case, you're going to want to look in the Mastering Index Tuning courses, and we give you additional options inside there, uh, like Indexed Views, for example. All right, there we go. There's a good handful of questions, or a good handful of answers to uh, get you all back on track. I am now going to go repack Eve's bags. Holy moly, I have to, uh, let's see here, give you a quick view of these. I have to uh, go repack click it over there, uh, repack Eve's bags for her uh, because we unpacked a bunch of stuff and this isn't even all of it. There's a lot more in the other room. Uh, go repack a bunch of stuff uh, before we go get on a flight and head back to the United States. And I will see y'all next time on Office Hours. Adios. <laughs>